Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Some people got it. All right, hallelujah. Good morning. I'm your pastor, Reverend Dr. Ron Hayden. I'm so glad to be here today. We had a wonderful baptism for Jessica and uh, have Christopher joined our fellowship from uh, Davidsonville United Methodist. We're just glad that you're, you're a part of our, our church. You've been part of our church for some time, but we got you official now. Hallelujah. And we're glad for that. And it's, it's an exciting time, as, as Jen mentioned, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to be in the church. New people joining. Easter, it's a wonderful time to, to be Easter people, because that's who we are, right? We're Easter people. Um, we're Easter people, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I want to uh, welcome those online, those that are watching uh, from home, those that perhaps if there's some in the parking lot, I'm just so grateful to be your pastor uh, this morning. And I love to be a part of the Easter people. To be part of the people who celebrate the risen Savior. That's what it means, right? We're people who are called together to be a people, not just individuals in the same place. You recognize the difference, right? You could all be in the same place, but it doesn't make you a people. If you go to a, to a, a, a game and you all root for the same team, it doesn't mean you're a people. You may be fans of the same team, but we're not just rooting for Jesus, are we? We're not just reading for Jesus. We're part of Jesus' people. We're part of the body of Christ. We're united. We're not just individuals in the, in the same people in the same place, but a people united in love of God and united in love for each other. At least I hope so. That's what we're supposed to be united in the truth of the resurrection of Jesus, united in the desire to live. Life to the fullest, following the example of Jesus our Lord. And you remember how Jesus lived, right? He loved deeply, loved everyone, cares fully, and gives of himself completely. This is the one we're following. This is what we are to be doing. We're Easter people. This is us. This is who we're called to be, who we're called out to be. Different from the world, but only until the world embraces the same loving Savior and merciful God. See, I I like to think that there's Christians and there's not yet Christians. Because I'm an optimist. See, I think the whole world, when they actually recognize and see and understand the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ... I don't know how anyone could resist him. No, I know that there may be some that never will accept him, and that saddens me. I think it should sadden all of us. I know it saddens God. But today, I'm excited about being part of Easter people. I'm excited that I do not have to, and I truly cannot do this alone, but that we can live this exciting life together, because that's what it is to be part of a people. United together. And and the truth is, not only can we live this life together, but we need to live this life together. We need each other. Jen had a wonderful illustration. Put that out here a little bit more, Jen, so everybody can see it. Because the choir couldn't see it, so make sure you just let them see. You were holding it. I couldn't see it at all from where I was. See, it's a mosaic of sorts of all of us together making something unique, something beautiful. God made something beautiful. Of course, each one of us is a masterpiece, but together we are something so much more. It's how we were designed so that we could help each other. The unique thing about Christians, about Easter people, is that Uh, It's part of our DNA, part of our sequencing to be in fellowship with one another. For from the first Easter onward, being a Christian meant being in fellowship. There's really uh, not much said in the Bible about being a Christian by yourself. Christians are together. That's what Christianity really is, to, to be united with Christ and each other. At least when I say from the first Easter onward, 
I don't necessarily mean from the first uh, crack of dawn on that Easter Sunday. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. There weren't really any Easter people at first. And even in the middle of the day, they weren't sure there was any Easter people. But once they finally believed in Jesus, once they finally believed in the truth, once they finally knew Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, once they finally knew that and got that, Christianity was born as the fellowship of believers began. As I said last week, those of you who are paying attention, you're better, probably eager and waiting for me to give you the rest of the story, right? Somebody shake your head and say amen. amen. Thank you. I need that. Last week I told you we would see how the story transpired. What's the, the two disciples we talked about last week who were on the road to Emmaus once they had their Bible study with Jesus being their teacher, even though they didn't recognize him, we're going to see what happens next. Because last week we talked about the importance of Bible study together, about hearing the Word of God read in public, about getting that time together to be transformed by the Word. And as we talked last week, the disciples, two of them, were going to Emmaus, and they knew all the facts, but they didn't believe because facts don't transform. Facts inform. Facts give us information. But truth gives us transformation. And so they had the facts, but they didn't really have the truth yet. So Jesus tried to explain it to them in Luke 24. And that's where we're going to pick this up in Luke 24, verse 28. If you have your Bibles, you wish to turn there. If not, it's on the screen or in your bulletin. <coughs> it says, as they came... Near the village to which they were going, he, that's Jesus, walked ahead as if he were going on. Verse 29 says, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. These two disciples, as I said, you might remember, did not realize it was Jesus who had been with them. It was Jesus who was explaining the significance of the events that they had just witnessed on Holy Week. You know those events. Jesus came into town. People were waving palm branches. And then by the end of the week, they had him nailed to a cross. There was a sham trial. There was a, a public flogging, an execution, all during the Passover. They had known the events that happened that even known the events that the report of the women on the first day of the week that the women came and said that he was risen, but the facts, the information didn't transform. And so Jesus, as he was walking along with them, unbeknownst to them, began to explain. He expounded on the books of Moses and the prophets. In other words, from Genesis all the way through to Malachi, he explained to them how they could see this was what God had planned. This is what God had said. This is what God had predicted. It was what was supposed to happen. His teaching was compelling, I am certain. His exegesis sound. These disciples were enlightened. They were informed. They may be even understood, but they were not changed. Not yet. As we discussed, all information, all the facts are important, but they do not change minds or transform hearts. Sometimes what, what really changes us is an experience. John Wesley is famous for, his, uh, for lots of things, but one of the things he added to the Christian conversation that was missing in most of Anglicanism, what we call Episcopalian, uh, was that they understood that you could know about God from Scripture, from the Word. They knew, understood that you could uh, know about God from reason. It makes sense. They understood you could know about God from tradition. But John Wesley said, what you really need is after you get all that, you need an experience with God. And he had his heart strangely warmed, he said, when he recounts his experience. Ed, get this at a public reading of Scripture. <laughs> That's when he had his heart strangely warmed. He was in a, in a church service 
uh, listening to the pastor preach on, of all things, the preface to Romans from Luther's commentary. Not the thing that I would think would transform somebody, but God can use amazing things. And it was an experience with God because we need an experience. Sometimes it requires a holy moment. One thing is for certain, these disciples had enjoyed this time they had with their teacher as they were walking from Emmaus. Uh, initially, when he had met with them, they were sad, right? Remember, they, we said they stood there sad. But as he walked with them, explaining to them, they desired him to stay. They had so much a good time with him. They had so much a connection that they wanted this time to continue. What they realized, what they enjoyed was fellowship with God himself. They didn't even recognize that at first. But they had fellowship and it was an experience that they didn't even realize was transforming them. Nonetheless, as they get to the place they were going to stay, Jesus acted like he was going to go on. And they utilized the excuse of, ah, it's late in the day. Why don't you just stay? Give some radical hospitality. Uh, uh, It's almost evening. The day's now nearly over. This was on a human level, I suppose. They were... They respected this man because of his great teaching. They didn't really know who he was. This man obviously made them feel comfortable and at ease. This man, they, perhaps they felt they owed him something because of all that he was teaching. Because they knew that when they met him, they were standing there sad. And they knew now they weren't sad. They wanted him to stay. So perhaps they had a little emotional connection. And they're like, oh, you should just stay with us. So we can understand and see the joy of fellowship. That's what they were experiencing. The peace of camaraderie. The gentleness of friendship. But uh, to me, it's, it's, (laughs) I think it's funny. Jesus' little hesitation, his little indication, I'm just going to keep moving. His little, uh, you know, I'm just here for a minute. I'm going to go to the next town. Uh, it, It was really Uh, What he really accomplished was to give these disciples a chance to invite Jesus in. So that's what he did. He was with them the whole time, and then they're getting all this stuff that hadn't been changed yet, and he gives them a chance. Do you really want me, or is the information enough? I'm going to keep going. Sometimes Jesus says, you have to invite me in. I mean, you know the picture where Jesus stands at the door and knocks. There's no, I don't know if you've seen the picture, I think you have. There's no doorknob there for him to open the door. The door has to be opened for him to come in. So he's saying, I'm just going to go on. And they say, no, 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 come with us. He gives them an opportunity to invite Jesus to become a part of their life. They didn't even know it was Jesus, but they knew This was somebody they wanted to be a part of their life. So they invited him in. And in so doing, they gained the opportunity for true koinonia. Just thought I'd throw a Greek word at you. (laughs) See if you're still paying attention. True koinonia, which is the, the Greek word for Christian fellowship. And it starts with, of all things, if you don't know the story, this is going to blow your mind probably. Starts with communion. Look at verse 30. It says, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Does that sound familiar? Have you ever heard that before? Of course, that's, that's what we, we, we know, we expect. As Christians, that's what communion is. We, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. He didn't do all this to these disciples, but he did most of it. I mean, he takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it. I think something might have clicked. Remember, he was a guest. right? They invited him in. He was an invited guest, of course, but he was still a guest. And yet... 
<laughs> Jesus took it upon himself to take the bread, to bless it, to break it, and to give it to them. They invited him in to stay, and the first thing he wants to do, if you're going to invite me in, the first thing we need to do is have communion. I want to commune with you. Enough of the talking. We did that. Let's join in fellowship. Let's join over this meal. Let's recognize what it is. Because communion is the holiest and best way to have fellowship. See, that's where the real connection is made. Communion, you, you know, is a connection, not just one with another, but one and another. And God, it's a three-way meal. He so said, let, let's get this all together. Let's do this completely. It's not just a, a friendship meal, not just having tacos on a Tuesday. I mean, th this, is, th this is communion. Not just congeniality, but a real connection. At the table of the Lord. Connection through the body of Christ. That's why a Christian fellowship is unique and holy and divine. Because it's not our doing. You see, that's the difference. Christian fellowship is not just us choosing to become friends. It's us becoming part of the body of Christ together. Oh, I think you missed that. I thought, if, I thought you would have said hallelujah if you heard that. Maybe you missed it. It's not just us becoming friends. We can be friends. But fellowship is when we become one with the body of Christ and each other. The choir gets it. See, they, say, they always talk about preaching to the choir because the choir is supposed to be my amen corner. It's supposed to be helping me out here. And it is not our doing. It's God's doing. Unless you think I'm reading too much into this. Well, he was just breaking bread, Pastor. You're just going a little too far here. Can we just read the Scripture and see what it says? Sure. Let's do that. Read the Scripture. Look at verse 31. <coughs> then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. See, I didn't make that up. You see, when they broke the bread, when Jesus broke the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, then their eyes were open. Then it made sense. All the information combined with communion brought transformation. They recognized him. With the breaking of the bread, with the blessing, with the giving, with this act of communion, which no doubt was still fresh on their minds, Jesus revealed himself. And upon revealing himself, he vanished. Okay, that part's kind of weird, i got to say. I'll admit, I don't quite understand that. But they recognized him through the com communion meal. Hallelujah. Because Christ is risen. We're, this is week three of Easter, right? You know, we're still in Easter. <laughs> Traditional response. Uh, I don't know if I have it in here again, but I've been putting it in here several times so you get it. Traditional response, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. So why did he vanish? That's what we might ask. The amazing thing is, in the passage, in the gospel, the disciples didn't ask. It didn't even matter to them. For us, we're like, wait a minute. Here's a mystery here. What's going on? They didn't even concern themselves with that. They were satisfied with the experience that they had with Jesus. They didn't lament that there wasn't any more experience. They didn't lament, oh, Jesus, where did he go? They were just, can you believe what happened? We know who this was. It doesn't say they weren't looking for him. They were content to have found him. Well, you didn't hear that. That was a good one. In that instant, they were transformed. The lessons they learned took on new significance because now they believed. 
You see, that's when the information becomes transformative. But now they believed. Now they were Easter people. Now they were ready to change the world instead of only changing their location. Verse 32 reveals the reaction. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? While he was opening the scriptures to us? See, they don't say, where did he go? They say, oh, do you, do you remember what happened? You remember, I, I felt something. You felt something? Well, he was talking to us, but we didn't get it until now. See, they began to realize that God had been working through the Bible study. God had been working through this proclamation of the scripture, through the information. But it wasn't until the fellowship, the communion, that the transformation truly happened. John Wesley believes that communion is a converting ordinance. That's the words he uses. I wouldn't normally use that. But what he means is that as we take communion, we can be transformed because of the power of Jesus here in this place. And I think he has good scriptural resource for that. It took the fellowship of communion for all that information to make sense. It took Jesus' broken body to put all their pieces together. And once they knew the truth, once it was clear to them that Christ had risen... Right. Once they knew the truth, once it was clear to them that Christ is risen, they immediately took action. That same hour, verse 33 says, that same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They didn't wait. They didn't sleep on it. Doesn't say they finished their meal, but it was an hour. Maybe they finished their meal. I mean, but it didn't take too long. They made haste to go and give this report. It reminds me a little bit, since this is the end of Luke, Luke 24, of the beginning of Luke. Remember the beginning of Luke when the report came about the Savior being born to some shepherds? How, what was their response? They made haste to go and see this report. And here, these Disciples ran back to tell people. It was eight miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Even though they had told Jesus, it's getting late in the day, maybe you should just stay. They got up and ran those eight miles in the twilight. I don't know how long it would take to run eight miles for me in the middle of the night by the time you get there. Probably next morning but for me, but they didn't have a nice... A cord to get into. Thank you. Yes. Some of you are slow, but that's okay. You're getting it. They had to run back to the place that they had taken them all day to travel away from to tell the disciples the news. This was not news to sleep on. This was not idle chatter, as they had heard earlier, that they believed. This was revolutionary. This could and would and did change the world. And at this point, all they knew was that it had changed them. All they knew was they were changed. And they had to go tell people. And they wanted to go tell the 11. Because one of them was no longer there. They wanted to tell the rest of the disciples. But when they got there, they discovered something amazing. The 11 were already talking about Something pretty awesome also. Verse 34, when they got there, it says, they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. The 11 already knew, because Jesus, perhaps, when he left these two, and Emmaus shows up to Simon. All we know for sure is by the time they get back there, they couldn't travel as fast as Jesus. By the time they got back there, Simon had already seen it. And he was reporting to the 11. Now, i got to admit, I love and I hate this fact. I love it because it's true. 
and it reveals human nature. And I hate it because it reveals human nature, and it's true. You see, you don't understand maybe what I'm talking about. The good news is that they were all excited about the truth that Jesus Christ has risen. risen. (laughs) And they knew that they knew this fact because Simon, Peter as he's commonly referred to, had seen him. Peter had given the report that Jesus is alive. And when Peter says Jesus is alive, they all seem to receive it. Well, this is good news. But the reason I hate it is because the women, at least three different women from earlier in chapter 24, had already given the report that Jesus is alive. And they thought it was idle chatter. Got the amen choir that time, didn't I? <laughs> the women said it and they were dismissed. Peter says it. Everybody's excited. That's the truth. And it's a shame. But the Bible doesn't report much else about it. It just lets that be there for us to see. The Bible reports this but makes no distinction. Because the truth of the matter is, should have, they should have believed the women. But the important thing is, they believed. And once they believed, they were changed. They were excited. They were happy. They were declaring, the Lord is risen indeed. I didn't make that up. It's right there. Verse 34, the Lord is risen indeed. So the news was beginning to spread. Easter people were beginning to be born. As Cleopas and his companion met the eleven, they gave their report in verse 35. It says, then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. See, once they were transformed, they began to give their testimony. I want you to see this too. They told what had happened. That's what a testimony is, right? You tell what happens in your life and how you came to understand Jesus is real. And so they began to tell, oh, let me tell you what happened. We were on the road, and this guy shows up, and we're like, don't you know what's going on? And we told him all about Jesus, and he told us how God had said that all along. He opened the Scriptures to us. And once he broke the bread, this is what the Scripture says, how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Once he broke the bread, we realized it was Jesus all along. <laughs> you see, the first thing, the first people that we need to tell when we become transformed is the family of God. That's the first people they told. They didn't go out and tell strangers. They went out and told the people they thought were most likely to believe. The, most, the people they thought most likely to share their experiences. The people they thought most likely would encourage them, would say, oh, wow, would be excited with them. You see, the family of God, the the fellowship, the koinonia is important because it's through this family that, that we can relate to each other through our experiences of God. The world doesn't always get that. That's why Christian fellowship is different than our worldly friends because we could talk about God with them and they're like, I don't know what they're talking about. We talk about God with each other, hopefully we can say, amen. We can say, hallelujah. We can admit, oh yeah, I've had an experience like that, or I haven't had an experience like that, but I'm excited for you. I love to hear that story. One of the favorite songs. I love to tell the story. One of the verses in that says, for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. You see, we love to hear when people tell about their experience with God because it increases our faith as well, testifying to what we know about Jesus. It's a building up of the fellowship and encouragement to each other. This should be a safe place where we can share 
what we know and what we have experienced with God so that we can process it for one reason, so that we can rejoice with each other and we can grow in our faith as well. It's, key part, it's a key part of the Christian fellowship, a crucial part to the building up of the body of Christ as we live this life together. We see this illustrated all the more in Acts chapter 2 in the lesson that Jen read earlier, Pastor Jen. said, after 3,000 were saved and baptized on the day of Pentecost, verse 42 said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. We see the first few steps we've mentioned in our life together. I mean, we're doing the series, Life Together, and the first two steps we mentioned was a study together, right? And then Christian fellowship. And here it says they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's studying, and to fellowship. That's the first two steps. And then the breaking of bread, which is truth, an act of worship, which we'll be covering next week. They were devoted to it. And included with this fellowship was this communion meal that unifies and binds us together. In a few minutes, we'll get to share this holy meal, this sacrament, whereby we believe we can also encounter Jesus, where we can recognize all the truths, all the information. We can recognize the reality of the resurrection, the truth of his death, burial, and resurrection. And we recognize the difference it can make to transform our lives. As we saw in the Acts chapter 2 passage, as the passage continued, it says, they spent much time together. They broke bread together. They spent this time with each other. Christian fellowship. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. There's something powerful in Christian community. There's something powerful when we spend this time together because we get encouragement, we get boldness, we get strength from each other as we get unified in the body of Christ. And so when people see this, they're like, I want to be a part of that. I need to be a part of that. That's different in the world. And I want that. The difference, of course, is Jesus. Because Christ is risen. As we continue to learn how to live in Christian fellowship, it starts with a meal. But it doesn't end there. Galatians, Galatians reminds us and includes bearing one another's burdens helping each other in our time of need, living out the commandment to love our neighbor as ourself, perhaps more to the point Jesus' new commandment, which he gave on that holy week, when he says, love each other as I have loved you. By this, all people will know you are my disciples. This is Christian fellowship, being in company with one another, sharing this holy meal together, being a part of the fellowship of believers and loving each other. So often, I don't know, maybe I'm just idealistic. I already told you I'm optimistic. Some churches call each other brother and sister. When you come to see each other at church, Brother Lee, right? Sister Christy. We see all these people that are part of the family of faith because we are united in a way that's deeper than just our DNA. We're united by the eternal blood of Jesus Christ. They say blood is thicker than water, and by that they usually mean our, our genetic ties. But I offer to you his blood is thicker than any water or any other ties. This is your family. Love each other as Christ, as Christ loved you. And in the words of Paul to the Galatians, verse 9, he says, So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. 
So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith.